This is the second in a series of lectures by Dr. Herbert Marcuse. Here is Dr. Marcuse. Last Tuesday, I tried to <clears throat> discuss with you some of the objective forces and tendencies in our society which may make for radical social change, and I tried to evaluate in very general terms the prospects of the radical opposition. Tonight, I will try to have a look at the human beings who are on the way or are supposed to be on the way working for radical social change and I shall try to uh, identify as well as I possibly can uh, what is in their mind well I should almost say and what is in their bodies as you will see, uh, because one thing I want to stress from the beginning, if what I have to say sounds fantastic, very far removed from reality, idealizing, romanticizing, the answer I have is that unless we uh, can get ourselves to become aware of the full scope and depth of the social change that may be ahead, we may miss some opportunities. Now before I discuss these new subjects of change, and I may say to my great joy, quite a few of them are among you here, I would like in a very brief restatement outline the new character of social change today, the new character of social change in the advanced capitalist countries. Three things I think we have to keep in mind. First, that if there should be such a change or in short, a revolution. It will be generated at a high level of productivity and consumption for the majority of the population. And therefore, we have a phenomenon which seems to be new in history, namely the displacement of the revolutionary potential from the traditional groups considered to be potentially revolutionary to minority groups and even to minority groups that seem to be on the margin of the social process. Thirdly, this new opposition is, I think, activating dimensions and levels of the human existence which have so far remained more or less unaffected in the historical revolutions and this opposition is activating these levels of human existence first as far as the individual himself is concerned namely radicalism today affects the physiological existence of man his whole organism. And secondly, for the society at large, the revolution is total in the sense that it would be, and perhaps first of all, a cultural revolution, and that in it the arts, literature, music, and so on, would play a role far more decisive than in any previous revolution. With this third aspect, the last one I shall deal on Saturday. Today only uh, to the individuals themselves. And here I would uh, suggest that what is at stake today in the work for social change 
is a new relationship of man to his own nature, that is to say to his body, to his drives, to his senses, and a new relationship of man to external nature, both these factors as catalysts of social change. Now the emergence of this new dimension of radicalism is, I believe, revealing. It reveals the extent to which the domination of man by man has taken place through the domination of nature. Through the domination of nature in the twofold sense, first, the scientific and technological control, the social control of man's own nature, the social control, the scientific social control of his drives and impulses, even of his unconscious, and this again in two main forms, the technological sublimation of aggressiveness, by which I mean that today the most violent, the most sweeping, the most inhuman acts of aggression hide the subject of aggression, because in these cases all you have to do is press a button or pull a lever and the thing will go and destroy I don't know how many square miles of foodstuff, of forests, of human beings. In other words, the concrete subject of aggression disappears behind the technological veil and with its disappearance, the sense of guilt formally previously bound up with such aggressiveness is effectively repressed. After all, it is a machine which does the destruction and not the human being himself. Secondly, the scientific and technological control of human nature, the steering of human instincts and their satisfaction, takes place in uh, what I would like to call the technological desublimation of sexuality. The technological desublimation of sexuality, usually under the title the liberalization of sexual mores and morality, greatly helped and sparked by the beauty industry, by the liberalization of dress or undress, by the pill, other contraceptives, all these which promise and give sexual satisfaction formally restricted take place, however, within the well-working framework of effective social repression. All these liberties you have within a repressive society, which of course means something for the value, human value of these liberties. That much for human nature as the object of domination, now external nature as the object of domination, and there we see it today especially as the object of capitalist domination through the violent and profitable commercial exploitation of nature through which the life environment of man is transformed in accordance with the laws of profit. Thus, in this twofold sense, nature has become the extended arm of society and 
we can imagine no liberation of man, no emancipation of man, without literally a revolution in the sensibility of man and in his relation to external nature. The revolution in the sensibility of man, meaning that without the radical transformation, not only of his consciousness, but also of his modes of perceiving, feeling, hearing, touching and smelling things, without this radical transformation, there can be no real radical change in our society. You may well speak here of a liberation of nature, not only of human nature, but also of external nature, provided that we do not think of any romantic return to a pre industrial stage of any such thing as the good savage or whatever it may be. The essential relation between man and nature which comes to the fore today, which comes to the fore in the changes that is going on in the very sensibility of man, in his impulses and drives in his body and not only in his mind, this essential relation between nature and freedom has been tabooed in the history of Western civilization, and it has to a great extent been relegated to the poetic imagination. This relegation and confinement of some of the most radical possibilities of human freedom to the poetic imagination, to fiction, to the arts, this, it seems to me, is being undone today. What is at stake is the uncovering of the roots of liberation in the mind and in the body of man. Or, in other words, a free society presupposes not only new institutions and new relationships of production, not only a break with the dominant rationality that has built these institutions and relations, but also with the basic experience of the world, a break with the familiar sense certainty we have acquired, a break with the manipulated needs and satisfaction to which we have become accustomed. And this break, this emergence of a new type of human being must take place prior to the construction of a new society because otherwise the chances are that the old Adam is reproduced and that human beings carry over their own repression and their own aggressiveness into the new society. The question was raised on Tuesday, how can one envisage as a realistic possibility that the whole thing does not repeat itself on a higher level, that is to say, domination does not repeat itself in a streamlined and perhaps more rational form. I can see only one way which may counteract this historical tendency, namely that the very men and women who are supposed to make the revolution and to work for it are already of a different type of human being 
that has as much as this is possible at all discarded and emancipated himself from the repressive needs and satisfactions which are part and parcel of the established society. Now, the tendencies toward a new sensibility which I would like to discuss today can be summed up in the concept of emancipation of the senses. Emancipation of the senses. You probably know that this is a Marxian concept that it has been developed at great lengths in the economic philosophical manuscripts of 1844 and it has usually been discarded by Marxists as belonging to the young Marx only as an immature conception which has been superseded and correctly superseded by the mature economic and political theory. Recently this traditional interpretation has been corrected and one has seen how much actuality, how much foresight, how much projection, realistic projection is precisely in the writings of this period. And still these writings have in my view been read the wrong way. They have been read as the first inklings of what is called today a humanistic socialism, humanitarian socialism, as contrasted with the Stalinist construction of socialism. Now, I believe that the economic philosophical manuscripts have indeed to be reread but reread not as a document of humanism, but as a document of a conception of socialism far more radical than the one that comes out in the later economic and political theory. And I hope I can at least give you a glance of it tonight. Marx speaks of the emancipation of the senses as the basis for a new rationality. He calls the senses practical. He calls them a productive force. In this respect, he discovers the aesthetic dimension as a political dimension. Uh, some of you may know that I have tried uh, to uh, emphasize what has been happened to the word aesthetic and what is characteristic of the development of bourgeois civilization. It originally meant, I may repeat it very shortly here, it originally meant, that is to say, into the 18th century, pertaining to the census. That is a meaning, aesthetic as pertaining to the senses, to the sensibility of man, as contrasted with logic, as pertaining to the mind of man. Then in the 18th century, for reasons uh, which I cannot discuss here, but in a very interesting way, the term aesthetic has been relegated to and restricted to the arts to the dimension of the arts, literature, the visual arts, and so on. Now, the aesthetic dimension, as Marx rediscovers it in, this write, in these writings, and as I will use the term now, goes back to the original meaning, namely pertaining to the sensibility of man, if you wish, the science of the sensibility of man, of his senses. I said the aesthetic dimension, in this sense, is a political dimension. 
the senses are potentially revolutionary forces and they are revolutionary forces especially under the conditions of contemporary capitalism which depends for its further working on the constant mobilization, stimulation and modification of human sensibility, of human sensuality. The merchandises, human as well as objects, the merchandises produced in the society must be stimulating to the senses. That is the capitalist aesthetics of today. Merchandises, stuff that has to be bought and sold, exchangeable stuff, but nevertheless highly stimulating and satisfying to the senses. Now, precisely, and I indicated that on Tuesday already, this constant stimulation of the sensibility of man required by the present stage of the capitalism may well release forces which undermine the stability of the capitalist system. But instead of speculating further on it, let me uh, come back uh, to the Marxian uh, conception which implies far more than simply a desublimation of the human instincts, far more than mere instinctual liberalization, far more than the individual release of sensuality. What it implies is a new socialization of man, a construction, emergence of new relationships between human beings based on a new experience of the world we live in and this experience in turn giving rise to a new political practice. I will briefly sum up the principal conception which Marx gives in these writings. Emancipation of the senses. The senses become practical in the reconstruction of the social environment as generating new relationships between men, between men and things, between man and nature. The senses become in this way sources or resources of a new rationality freed from the rationality of acquisition, competition and exploitation. That is the preservation and cancellation of the achievements of the achievements of the technological rationality of the preceding forms of society. Now what does it mean that the emancipated senses will generate not only human beings as individuals but these individuals in new relationship to other individuals? It means negatively that the ego, the other, and the object world are no longer experienced in the context of aggressive acquisition and defensive possession. That means dissolution of the bourgeois ego, which was essentially an ego generated by and based on these acquisitive, defensive and possessive relationships. It means further negatively 
that subject and object no longer confront each other as mere items in the struggle for existence, competing in performing a role, but, and here Marx uses a strange term, the emancipation of the senses will result in what he calls the human appropriation of nature. The human appropriation of nature. That is to say, transformation of nature into an environment for the development of the human being as, these are his words, species being, and the strange term means nothing more and nothing less than as a being which indeed for the first time can freely develop and satisfy its specifically specifically human faculties. Specifically human faculties and these are the creative faculties of man and his aesthetic needs and faculties. So you have here the first conception of a revolutionary aesthetics as contrasted with the capitalist aesthetics, and aesthetics not as pertaining to art, but as productive force. Reconstruction of society in the radical redirection of the process of production. A redirection which would take care which would take into account in the mode of production itself the aesthetic and create creative needs and faculties of man. Again, creative, here contrasted with capitalist productivity, work, here contrasted with alienated labor, meaning work with things, and other human beings and not against things and other human beings. The result would be the formation of the object of matter and again I quote also for the sake of the thing and not only for my own sake. This is perhaps the most speculative but also one of the most interesting conceptions of Marx, which goes way back into the history of Western thought, namely the assumption that there is such a thing as an objective freedom in nature, as counterpart and element of human freedom, namely a drive a striving in matter, perhaps also an inorganic matter, to show, to display its inherent qualities, its own potentialities, to be, to become what it can become, without violence, without distortion, without being oppressed, without being smashed. These are indeed aesthetic qualities and Marx makes them explicit. Explicit in one of the most advanced formulations and in a formulation which seems to fit very little the traditional image of Marx we have, namely he says that man is a being who is able to form his world in accordance with the laws of beauty. In accordance with the laws of beauty. 
I think you will admit it is indeed a strange formulation if you uh, look at it in the light of the usual picture of Marx, and still I think it is one of his most advanced formulations. What is at stake here is not nearly the materialistic translation of the aesthetic into a socialist reality, but rather the failure to carry out this concept into the critique of political economy. Marx himself, as he, if he would have been afraid of the radical consequences of this conception, has not built it into the later economic and political theory. Now, I could still give you a brief glance at this concept in the light of the history of Western thought, but I'm afraid it would take too long and I will only enumerate some of the main points. The concept of a revolutionary aesthetics, of the radical emancipation of the senses in the reconstruction of society is one that has already been alive in the long tradition of the heretic materialistic schools of thought, in the hedonistic and sensualistic philosophies from antiquity to the Enlightenment. It is even compatible with Kant's aesthetic in the third critique, and it is perhaps most interesting, the materialistic, the materialistic reformulation of Hegel's concept of nature as objective spirit, as manifestation of the spirit. Moreover, this idea, the idea that there is in nature itself, in the things themselves, something that would make for human freedom and for freedom of nature itself, the idea of inherent aesthetic qualities in things may well recapture the most ancient theory of recollection, knowledge as recollection, namely the discovery of the true forms of things, the discovery of the true forms of things, which are distorted and denied in the established reality. This conception which places sensibility in the center of radical social change, desublimates the idea of freedom without abandoning the transcendent content of freedom, namely that it is not yet a reality, that it is still a historical and political goal. It desublimates the idea of freedom, because freedom now appears as rooted in the sensibility of man. The senses do not only receive what is given, they are not only, as Kant believed, the basis for the epistemological construction of reality, but the senses may also serve as basis for the transformation, subversion, of the established sensibility and for a rational organization of society. Or the senses do not delegate this necessary transformation of the given data to another faculty, the mind, the understanding, reason. Rather, the senses discover, or at least can discover by themselves, in their practice, 
now new and more gratifying possibilities and capabilities, new forms and new qualities of things. In this sense, the senses have their own rationality, striving to become reason. And emancipation of the senses, far from collapsing into mere sensuousness, would mean developing the new sensibility to serve as the rational basis for the construction of a new society. This emancipation of the senses, and that is why I spoke of a desublimation of freedom, would make human freedom what it is not yet, namely a sensuous need, not only a value, not only an economic need, not only a political goal, but a sensuous need. Without it, without the satisfaction of it, you cannot live. It would make freedom a sensuous need, an objective of the life instincts themselves, an objective of errors. However, not the repressed sensibility in a repressive society, but only the emancipated senses working on the construction of a free society can possibly fulfill this radical function of sensibility. In a society which is based on alienated labor, human sensibility is blunted too. Men perceive things and other human beings only in the forms and functions in which they are given, in which they are made, in which they are used by the existing society, and they perceive only those possibilities of transformation as defined by and confined to the existing society. And thus, and I think this is the most radical insight of the conception of the emancipated senses. Thus the existing society is reproduced not only in the mind of men, not only in the consciousness of men, not only in their behavior, but also in their senses. And no persuasion, no theory, no reasoning can break this prison unless affixed the petrified sensibility of the individuals is dissolved, that is to say is opened to a new dimension of history, a new dimension of practice. Or, in other words, until the oppressive and submissive familiarity with the given object world is broken, broken in what I like to call a second alienation, namely the methodical alienation from the alienated society. I should like to quote here the famous statement by Rimbaud which is only too easily misunderstood today. He speaks of a dérèglement de tous les sens. Dérèglement de tous les sens as aesthetic and political principle, as radical aesthetic and political force. It is the same insight that only if a radical change in the sensibility of man takes place, is there a chance that a qualitatively different society can be created? Now I have at several occasions uh, referred uh, to the tradition of Western thought in order to uh, show you 
to what extent a great, mostly underground and repressed radical tradition is revived in today's rebellion of the militant youth. What appears easily as a revolt of a spoiled elite, as playful or violent disorder, as mere negation, without solid foundation and without goal, what easily appears as irrational protest is in fact, or let me say more carefully, can be, ought to be and should be, rooted in one of the strongest foundation of radical change, namely the experience that repression and destruction are not only in the social institutions and in the social hierarchy, but also in the very instincts and senses of man, and that therefore the individuals themselves produce and reproduce constantly their own enslavement, their own aggression, their own ignorance, and that their life instincts have been consistently thwarted, weakened by the systematic mobilization of aggression in the defense of the established society. Consequently, no revolution is a revolution unless and until it brings about radical change not only in the social institutions, not only in the consciousness and mind of man, but also in his senses, in the instincts, in the bodies of man. In conclusion, I would like to stress what I try to stress on Tuesday, that this new unprecedented scope of the rebellion and of the historical goals of the rebellion has become possible thanks to scientific and technological progress. Thanks to scientific and technical progress, and also thanks to the terrible sacrifices brought by those who have fought suppression and injustice throughout the century. These unprecedented goals, unprecedented because for the first time in history we have the resources to attain them, are not attainable through better ways of adjustment. They are not attainable through private release and letting go. They are not attainable through dropping out of politics. They are attainable only in a long and painful process of political education in theory and in practice, in and outside the classroom, on the streets, on the media. I want to answer, anticipating it, one question very briefly. Is perhaps the present sweep of ecology an indication that this new sensibility is indeed on the march and that it is indeed already in the process of radically changing the world? Certainly, this sweep of ecology is indeed evidence for what I'm trying to say, or did try to say, namely to the extent to which nature, not only human nature but external nature, is rediscovered as a life environment of human freedom. But ecology today shares with all forms of oppositional activity the ambivalence of the whole in which good and bad, 
strengthening and weakening of the establishment are inseparably united. The idea of the emancipation of the senses, of a new sensibility, and of the transformation of nature in accord with the new sensibility is more and other than ecology. Certainly, the fight against pollution, noise, ugliness is good and even productive. However, at stake is not the beautification of the existing environment, but its total reconstruction. And this implies elimination of the sources of the far larger pollution, the mental and physical, the political pollution in the system itself. A clean and beautified general dynamics plant is still a general dynamic plant, <laughs> producing the same stuff. And a clean hydrogen bomb is still a hydrogen bomb. And although it is good and vital to breathe cleaner air, it would still be the air of violence and exploitation on a global scale. Unless and until the ecological praxis is used in political practice. And with this shift in the historical level of the protest, with this radicalization of the goals, the space, the dimension of the political practice is changing too. The struggle is not any more fought in terms of parliamentary business, parties, votes, lobbies, whatever it may be, but it is waged from outside while within the establishment and in terms alien to the establishment. And here lies one of the dangers of this opposition, a danger which I just indicated is rooted in the deep ambivalence which all actions have in our existing society. Let me quote one of the young German radicals who said recently, each of us radicals is somehow infested, moronized, saturated, distorted, by the goods and evils of the existing society." End quote. These infecting agents cannot simply be pushed aside. The opposition must recognize them and must be able to deal with them on its own terms. In one way or the other, however, the new values of a free, decent, and fair society with non-alienated relationships between individuals, these new goals must somehow show forth in the behavior of the non-conformists today, which from the beginning excludes any premature identification between personal and private release and social liberation. For example, the famous sexual revolution is none if it does not transcend <coughs> and transform itself into a revolution of the whole human being, of the whole human being with new social and political goals. The distinction, which is absolutely indispensable for the movement, the distinction between self-indulgence and liberation, between phony and authentic non-conformism, between crime and political action, this vital distinction must be made 
by the militants themselves. It cannot be imposed upon them by any authority whatsoever. But if they do not make this distinction by themselves, if they do not find their own discipline, their own organization of spontaneity, and all authentic spontaneity is organized in one way or the other, then they will have dangerously weakened the only force that stands today between us as we are here and an intensified repression, the consequences of which I would not like to foresee. Thank you.